Hello and welcome to Watchworthy. It's your co-host, Brother Ash. And I'm Miss Chris D. In today's episode, we got something special for y'all, for y'all hoopers out there especially. We're going to be covering Shattered Glass, a WNBPA story. Uh, this documentary came out this year, 2024, on Tubi. So this is, you know, Tubi dope. Exclusive. Yeah, dope to have something good coming from Tubi, because you know we always talk about them <laughs> Tubi movies. <laughs> so this doc follows the woman during the 2023 season, so the, the last season yeah, just uh, passed. that just passed. Uh, and it features WNBPA leaders as well as players. Players Neke Ngwomike, uh, John Quell Jones, and Brianna Stewart. Shout out to my Bahamian uh, yes, people, uh, John Quell Jones representing. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> the reason why we chose this doc is because one is Women History's Month, so that's always dope, yeah. right? But a lot of people, you know, don't really get to talk about the WNBA, the WNBA a lot. Um, so when I saw this documentary, I thought it would be dope so I could get to learn more about the organization because obviously we know like the huge fall off between the NBA yeah. and the WNBA. I have and- to admit, as a woman, I don't even watch the WNBA. So this was, I was compelled to watch this to learn more. So that's why we wanted to watch it, to learn more. So while you guys watch, especially our Spotify listeners, don't forget to answer our poll question. What will make you tune into more WNBA games? What is it going to take? Like what? knowing the players, celebrity appearances, tough competition, or nothing. Maybe you just rather see guys do this instead. We honestly want to know. Yeah. And we'll give you our reasons we'll uh, talk about, about you know, and later in the episode. So let's kick things off by talking about the WNBA and how it got started. The WNBA was founded in 1997, so it's younger than me. <laughs> it's this a millennial. League, yeah, this league <laughs> hasn't been around very long. Or is it Gen Z? I think that would make it a millennial. Ah. A zillennial? Whatever. The point is, it's a very young league, a very young organization. And it started in 1997, right on the cusp of the 1996 Olympics. And that Olympics really gave women's sports and women's basketball in particular a boost and, and a spotlight. So the hype was real. Remember the 90s and the 2000s, like mm-hmm. WNBA? Lisa Leslie was on like every sitcom or whatever. So I think I'm going to insert the first red, oh, flag red flag of the episode. because. I'm just surprised that it, it is so young because I know women have been playing basketball for a, a long time. Yeah. So, like, I wonder what it took for them to. I mean, I guess you you hinted at it with the Olympics being how big it was in '96. Wasn't that the one in Atlanta? Probably. I think it was. So, uh, hmm, I don't know. That just stood out to me that the league. No, yeah, is, you're right. Why did it's it younger take so than me? Like, because yeah. <laughs> men's basketball, WNB, W, I'm sorry, NBA, they've yeah. been playing since what the '50s. Uh, I don't know when they were founded, but definitely, yeah, yeah. you know. So we, they have quite yeah. a few years on When them. we covered Bill Russell, he got drafted in the 50s. Yeah. And they didn't make it seem like the NBA was brand new, so. <laughs> so, yeah, the point is, like, they really had a big boost in the 2000s, but as we know now, the WNBA has kind of become like a punchline. People always joke about, like, oh, you watching that, or they only got 10 people in the stands. And it's because we learned in this documentary, it really comes down to marketing and media. And they don't get the media coverage like the NBA, and they don't get the media marketing dollars like the NBA so that's kind of why the WNBA fell off Mm. and so today we know that women all across the the country are driving economic success whether it's in art or film they showed music Beyonce Taylor Swift you know women are really doing their thing we really have been having like a few years of like girl power and so why can't we do the same in sports they're saying you know it's the perfect time for women to finally get paid with their worth And so the WNBPA, that's the Women's National Basketball Players Association. That's kind of like their union. They are one of 60 trade unions under the AFL-CIO, which also includes the SAG-AFSTRA union. So, you know, when they had like the writers and actors strike in summer 2023, these basketball players were right on the sidelines with them because we're all part of the same organization and they kind of support each other through negotiations and strikes. So that was cool to see. I had no idea what any of those organizations were. Me neither. I didn't know that they were part of this like huger group of unions so it's incredible just in America in general maybe that should be a red flag why do we have to unionize in order to get just human rights and human basic needs you know we're not asking for much these ladies aren't asking for much all they want is some good benefits so it's incredible that um, you know in different industries across the country people are starting to unionize and gather it's sad that they have to be like activists and athletes at the same time so true. Because they're already, we learned in this documentary, they're tired, okay? They're going from bus to plane to bus to plane to yeah. game to practice. They're tired. The life women is, are putting in the same work as the NBA. That lifestyle is no joke. Like, yeah. being a professional athlete is very intense. 
Right. And so in 2020, the WNBA and the WNBPA finally negotiated a groundbreaking collective bargaining agreement, or we're going to call it a CBA. And so come November 2024, this year, the WNPA has the option to opt out of that CBA. Basically, uh, we don't like the terms that we signed to four years ago. We want to ask for something else now. And so they have, like, the rest of this year to figure it out until November. And so the documentary kind of showed the first meeting of the WNPA Executive Committee in October 2023. It was cool to get that all-access, behind-the-scenes look at them meeting to discuss, you know, their priorities. And as Brother Ash said, NECA... Ogumike, I hope I pronounced her last name right. Let's just stick yeah, with NECA. NECA. We're gonna yeah. stick with NECA. NECA is a player for the LA Sparks, and she's also the president of this. So yet again, like you said, black women having to wear many hats. Not only are you a player, but you're also a mentor. You're also a president on the committee and doing yes. all these things as a player. You know, using your voice to speak for your fellow players. That's like, and I'm not saying that he doesn't do this, but like, this is why like it's so. It's so dope to have athletes that we have today. You think of guys like LeBron that's doing it in the NBA, yeah. like, but it's really, really groundbreaking for the WNBA because like they're fighting for stuff that that the NBA like just naturally gets. And she mm-hmm. still has to like lace up her shoes and get on the flight or get on the court or make sure she gets to practice. Like that's yeah. insane to me. Like that's insane. Yeah, like, <laughs> and honestly, they didn't show much about her love life. They showed some of the others' love life. I wonder if she even has time for any of that stuff. She's Maybe. probably just locked in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so NECA is one of the most respected voices in the WNBA. She's been playing for like 13, 12, 13 years. And she said that she leads by listening because that's really what that's what we're missing. The companies aren't listening to us. The mm-hmm. company's like, have a pizza day. We're like, fair wages? They're like, no. I'm allergic to gluten, <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> like, or we're going to give you Fridays off or like dress down Fridays. We don't want that. We want Bruh, wages. We that's, want- <laughs> that's like one time my job, they came around and they gave us like fucking tote bags and <laughs> fucking pencils in the tote bag. Like, what am I, a fucking kid? I got to fill out a Scantron later today or something? What am I supposed oh to do gosh. with this? <laughs> give me some PTO, bro. So it's good that they actually have actual players on the executive committee who are really leading by listening. And she said that she, in the documentary, she said, you know, she's already thinking about what's life after basketball because we know professional athletes, they kind of have a small window to play. So if she's already been at this for 12, 13 years, she's like a vet at this point. So she's thinking maybe commissioner after all this is said and done. So I'm rooting for NECA to get commissioner for sure. If we could do green flags, shout out to her for like saying, yeah, after I, you know, uh, I'm the president of the uh, WNPBA, mm-hmm. and then like a star player in the NBA of uh, WNBA for so long. I think I'm gonna just be the commissioner next. Yeah. Like that's like once Patrick Mahomes retires, if he says, "Yeah, I'm gonna just go take Roger Goodell's <laughs> spot," that's crazy. Well, it's crazy because she said like most people they'll be like, "All right, I'm done with this. Like you leave a job, that's it, peace out." But for her, she wants to stay involved, and she said a lot of the other retirees want to stay involved too. So, you know, these are really highly decorated women. We see in the documentary, not only NECA, but John Quell Jones and Brianna Stewart, they have both just gotten drafted to the New York Liberty during the time of this filming. And so we got to see them go through the, the season and see their ups and downs. And so these are really highly decorated women who are all have all made sacrifices. Like um, Brother Ash said, you know, John Quell, she's from Bahamas. She had to move to the from the Bahamas to America in high school to play basketball and then finally... I guess the top is the WNBA, but we know that it's not even respected in America. So it's really tough, but it's better than nothing. And from her perspective, she thought like, she said Bahamian sports culture wasn't really big about women's basketball either. So like coming to the States was the big leagues and the WNBA is like considered the big leagues to a lot of, you know, different places. So right. So, um, speaking of that, they're just asking for basic needs, right? And one thing that we learned that was interesting is their current CBA, their current um, bargaining agreement, doesn't allow them to charter planes. So you got pro athletes. You think LeBron James will be sitting in first class on Southwest? No. They don't even have first class on Southwest. They're on commercial flights. They're on commercial (laughs) flights. So the point is, you know, these are things like that's a kind of a health and safety issue of professional athletes. You got them on regular planes with Joe Schmo. That's a red flag right there, baby. Put a red flag for me because I don't, I don't get how they. Those are like basic needs. That's like when we heard Taraji coming out and saying that they didn't even have good trailers at the Color Purple Facts. set. Like what? That's how do your, you expect them to perform at their best if you got them scrunched up on Frontier? That yeah, another red flag <laughs> for not treating your like your people's like they should be treated like. I know if I was a professional athlete 
especially as an NBA player, you stick out or a WNBA player. Like those right. women are tall. Like they're not tall for women. They're just tall. Right. They're six five, six four, and you know some of them are a little bit more like closer to regular height. But I could imagine walking onto a plane and seeing like. <laughs> Oh snap! That's the the star center yeah, for the Sparks. Like I would be surprised. now, people asking her questions and shit. Like I think it'll be dope. Like if they just had that like treatment that the NBA players get, but it exactly. goes it goes back to money and stuff. So exactly. So um, Terry Jackson, she's the executive director of the WNBPA, and she said in the documentary, even as we signed the twenty twenty CBA, it was again it was groundbreaking, it was glass shattering, but it wasn't enough. She said all of us knew there was still more work to do. Mm. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about salary and compensation, what I was talking about. Well, we kind of touched on it with the differences in money with yeah. the two different leagues. Uh, but CBAs essentially make the big wigs do what they agreed on with the players. So they're the ones that hold in like the, you know, commissioners and everybody who pushes the buttons on, you know, how people get paid, where the money goes. Like they're holding them accountable. Yeah. So all these women want basically is their fair share of the wealth that they are creating for their markets. So like you can say like, oh, like, cool. Like they don't make as much. Obviously, like LeBron James, you know, against... Steph Curry might sell out the Staples Center, or what is it called? Um, crypto? It's the crypto something now. <laughs> so they might bang in a bigger crowd, but I guess what they're just trying to say, they just want the fair share of it. Yeah. So like, if we make less, we should still be getting the same percentages and uh, some of the same benefits as our counterparts get. Exactly. So when people say WNBA players can make up to 700000 now let me just right, put... Right, you be hearing that a lot. Let me just put this into perspective for y'all. So... When you hear somebody say that, like when you look at a salary for a job and it says you can make up to $50,000 or $700,000 or $3 million, that doesn't mean everybody in the company is making that amount of money. That means the person who went to the finals, who was the MVP, who was who went to the All-Star game, who, uh, you know, led in every statistic, got all of that. Because you get, like, bonus opportunities to make yeah. money in sports leagues. So, like, you basically have to be Michael Jordan every year to get $700,000. And that's not a little bit of money to nobody. Yeah. But when you compare it to the NBA, it's like, all right, well, the best players in the NBA are making, like, some of them are making close to like $100 million a year. $100 million or compared least, to 700000 Or at least they'll have like a $100 million contract divided into three or four years. So like, yeah, I would feel some type of way too. It's really yeah. sad that the women are begging for pennies. Like, And like you said, you have to do all of that and stretch yourself thin and wear yourself out yeah. to possibly get the rare opportunity to make six figures. And also, you know, basketball being a physical sport, like you kind of got to make as much money as you can while you can. Yeah. Um, so if you don't get to accomplish all of those things, and realistically speaking, only one player can go to the all-star right, game, you ain't doing all-star do MVP. the finals MVP, be the league MVP. Like that's not something you can spread amongst five no. different people. So, uh, that just, it's kind of just to give you guys like an idea of where that much, how much money they can make compared to the NBA. Um, so a lot of players have to play abroad during the off season. Red flag, red flag. Red because flag. I didn't know that at all. When I watched this documentary, I mean, I said, you mean to tell me yeah. you got to play a U.S. regular season and, this, and then go over to China just to make ends meet? This ain't the summer league and this ain't, you know, how you see videos of LeBron and Melo, you know, playing at some super fancy secret gym. Um, you know, and they kind of going like three quarter speed. Like this league is like the official league for whatever yeah. country they're in. So they're playing against China's best players, uh, Russia's best players, and it's like weeks or days yeah. after their season ends. So it's like, as an athlete, you need that time to recover. So if you're but getting, they can't. yeah, they you're getting can't. done with one season, but it's the same mindset. Like while I'm young, while I can play basketball, let me go get this money because you know I'm not guaranteed the same things. Yeah. Um, so Brianna Stewart shared there aren't many moments to excel because when we have to say yes to opportunity because they don't come often. Yeah. So that kind of spoke to me too. Like it's it's probably competitive amongst themselves. Yeah. You know that's what I mean? so true. So it, it really was sad to see them kind of racing from this appearance to this practice to this game and just realizing it's still not enough. It's still not even a fraction of what Steph Curry makes. So, yeah, and obviously, you know, these players, you want to get brand deals, you want to get sneaker deals, but I'm going to be real, yo, like, I don't watch the WNBA a lot, and, like, 
I feel like I've seen a picture on this documentary of, I think, Brianna Stewart on a poster in a sneaker store. And I feel like I've seen that picture before. I had no yeah. idea who that was. And I'm just being frank. Like, I don't want to no, sound No, I'm sorry, rude. but when Kelsey Plum came on, you were like, I know her. She's a football player's wife. Yeah, and... Oh, dang, you had no, I'm sorry, but, but the I'm point a Giants is, fan. No, but the point is, these women... As great as they are in their field, they're still not household names. Yeah, like yeah, it's really yeah. sad. And and that and just to also say, like they are hoopers, right? Like the same way some of your favorite basketball players been in AAU league since they was kids, and and you know these women are ballers. They went to like, UConn. Yeah, they like played they, four years at Stanford. Yada yada. I might not support the WNBA like by watching, but I'm definitely not one of those dudes that's like, oh, I could take one of them. No, you can't, yeah. bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> Even Necka said that she still has grown men come up to her and try to fake dribble in front of her. No. It's so like, corny. You will, it's so you, embarrassing. You will get embarrassed. Like, so uh, back in the day, Cheryl Swoops was like the all-star, you know, one of the biggest names in the NBA. Um, and she was the first signed player to the WNBA. And there wasn't any other woman organization to compare to the WNBA. So at the time, they just kind of like, yeah, you know. What we, do you have to go off of yeah. if you're the first one to do it? You don't know how much money to ask for. As a woman, like imagine being a kid growing up in the you know 70s and you tell your mom, yeah, I want to play on uh, TV one day in, in a yeah. women's basketball league. Everybody's telling you you're <laughs> it crazy. It doesn't even exist yet. <laughs> so they was just happy to be on TV playing basketball yeah. and getting any attention that they could. So like they were only making like 50K back then. <laughs> Red flag. So- <laughs> I just almost choked. You mean to tell me that... I, in, in my early career days, was making more than a WNBA player. Yeah. And granted, and their job is a lot more physical. The economy was definitely different in the 90s, but I bet you if you pull up some of them NBA salaries, it's still mighty, mighty higher than yeah. uh, what they was making. Uh, so back then, the players had to share rooms. Like, they, red flag. Come on red now. Red flag. Come red flag. On. And they had to come out of pocket for extra guests. And this is just something that, like, I want y'all to put into, like, perspective. Like, women, like, as a man, you make it to the NBA, you don't got to worry about, oh, I got to take a month off because I just got pregnant. Yeah. Or not even just a month. So, like, these women are traveling, got to bring their mom, got to bring their kids to watch the, you know, got to bring the mom to watch the kid. Because right. you can't leave the kid at home. So, like... Women just have different things to deal with that men don't have to deal with. So because of that, I feel like the WNBA just wasn't really like Necker there was should saying. Be better yeah, they weren't truly taking care of their players and like listening to the different unique things that they needed. Being just simply being women, right? Um, so Cheryl um, calls for a pension to be written for the new CBA. It's inclusive of back pay for retired players because they like yo the league twenty seven years old. We still have yeah. our, like, our, the way the NBA, like, uh, most of the NBA's OGs, like, we don't even know because it was so long ago, their names have kind of been forgotten, unless you're a super NBA fan. But the OGs of the WNBA are, like, in their 50s. People still remember like- Cheryl Swoops, <laughs> and she's just saying, I don't even have a pension. Like, you get a 401k if you work at Walmart. Could you imagine so- that? Could you imagine being freaking Lisa Leslie and not having a pension from the WNBA? Yeah, so they're saying basically since we do have a seat at the table now and we kind of are reorganizing the CBA, why don't we throw a pension in there while we're at it? Why don't we throw in a longer maternity leave? I think that they should. One, because they kind of hit on the rise of the WNBA. So I'm hoping that with that rise that profits are increasing and you are able to get more resources. But yeah, I'm with that, yo. Pay them. Pay them. They They deserve that. Yeah. So speaking of Cheryl Swoops, Cheryl was also, um, you know, talking about motherhood in the documentary. And she said that it's great when people come up to her like, oh, loved your record or whatever. But when people come to her and talk about motherhood in sports, that just warms her heart so much because she said that she was back on the court after, six weeks after giving birth, y'all. That's a red flag. I need a longer maternity leave. Red flag. Yo. But They gave her a month and a half. Th- yeah, that's about it. Because people now get like 12 weeks. She got like half of that. And it just goes to show how she really couldn't take a break. She had to work. I don't know what her man or her husband was doing at that time, but she was probably one of the breadwinners as a WNBA player, so she had to get back out there. And it was just, like you said, sad to see that even in such a high caliber and in such a high platform like the WNBA, they still have the same struggles as us, other yeah. women, you know, women in the workforce. And so um, Brianna Stewart, she knows that her window is getting smaller in the WNBA. She's like 29 years old, so it's time to start a family, but you got to keep playing basketball. And she's a lesbian. She's in a a, a lesbian relationship. So her 
first child was through a surrogate. Mm. And so some people had the nerve to be like, oh, well, you, you don't have the same issues as women because you use a surrogate. Like, I don't care who birthed the baby. Red right, flag. red flag. Because first of all, I think it was a man that made that comment. It was. For once again, let me just remind every man to shut the fuck up <laughs> when it comes to women in their bodies. Like, yes. what she need to want to do a surrogate to be a mother, that's her business and her business and her business only. So, like... Ugh, Period. I hate, I hate that. That's on Women's History Month. Get your dirty laws <laughs> off of my drawers. <laughs> That's the first time I heard that. Or they say like hands, hands, bands off my body or whatever. So yeah, get, leave women alone. Period. Um. So she, you know, made that comment on the documentary. She literally said like, "Well, fuck him if he thinks that." Literally. And so um, now they're on to their second child, and her partner it delivered the baby. So it doesn't matter who carried the baby. Dads and moms and everybody needs maternity leave and paternity leave, okay? Facts. And so she's just saying, you know, that's something that she hopes to have more benefits and a pension and everything in the new CBA. Um, and so, you know, critics have the nerve, nerve to say that motherhood isn't hard for them. And people say that, too, about, um, you know, any professional athlete. Mm -hmm. But Serena Williams had to tell her own doctor that she was in trouble in her pregnancy. She had to speak up for herself. One of the, one of the highest... One of the highest athletes, Serena Williams, has to tell a doctor, no, listen to me, and advocate for herself. So how do you think these women are doing? Like, it's just the same for all women across the board, no matter where you sit, whatever level, class you are. It really is the same, especially for women of color. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, pro basketball is also a form of entertainment, and that's exactly why people think that they can give their opinions on these women's bodies, their hair, their yeah. clothes. Um, because you're in the spotlight, so people are going to be like, oh, these ugly basketball, rough around the edges, women, I don't want to watch that. And that's just, it's so annoying. It's like people don't want to watch WNBA or, unless y'all made up with your titties or, out. Or you got the dudes that just watch the WNBA because they like some of the players that play, like, oh. some of the more, like, you know, like, Angel, attract, not, what's not attractive, but, um... What's that um, college basketball player, Angel Reese? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like dudes that like solely follow the WNBA. That's nasty, too. Red flag. Put a red, red flag. Red flag, flag, bro. Respect, respect them for their like, they skill. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, that's my thing. Like, I'm not going to lie. I don't watch a lot of WNBA games, mainly because I don't even watch a lot of basketball. You really don't. But if I, I do that. watch basketball, I might want to see... Like, you know, somebody get dunked on from the free throw line, which is crazy. But whenever I do find myself watching, like, WNBA, like, you can't help but notice how elite these athletes are. Right. Like, these women are ballers. Doesn't matter like, if man or woman. <laughs> like, they go hard in the gym. Right. Like, real life. So, needless to say, no matter where you sit, what class, if you're a pro athlete or a regular woman, you still got men trying to tell you what to do with your body. You still got people not valuing you and not paying your worth. Look, and that's that's pretty much the culture. And, and, and it's unfortunate, but that's like what we kind of just recognize. Like, wherever there's women doing something that men do, it's the same fucking thing. They're going to get less resources, less spotlight, less empathy. Um, so that's just where we are. So the culture is pushing more toward, it's pushing toward more women in sports. Yeah, we got um, like the um, Naomi Osaka's of the world, yeah, like Simone yeah, Biles. Yeah. So our culture is fighting the negative culture of, yeah. of the, you know, different negative connotations of women in sports. Um, and I love that. I love that for my niece, for, you know, any... Uh, you know, young girl out there. You got so many different idols and role models you can look up to now. 